Hello, everyone. Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com. This is the week and charts. What are we talk about? Well, we got a lot to talk about tonight. I guess before we do that, I got to thank all you guys and girls for attending. Sorry about that link. It should be fixed for next week. And if you did register for prior webinars, as I was talking with some of you guys before we went live, you should be brought over to the new webinar. Should be the keyword in that sentence, and you can always re-register, and I appreciate that. All right, so let's talk about what we're talking about. Well, current market conditions, I'm going to have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, there's only a few of you that were able to make it live, so feel free to uh, fire away. <laughs> Your favorite stock picks, you can start putting stock picks in anytime you want tonight. Just uh, put one at a time, and that way I can keep up with um, what's been done or not also if you are watching a recording in this on youtube first of all thanks and if you like it please like it and hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and if you don't like it go have no fun somewhere else <laughs> today i'm a little grouchy so i'm not kidding <laughs> now i'm half kidding i want to talk about or continue my discussion on doing trading stuff or not and there's a lot of things that i'm working on right now and I'm also working on the fine art of sitting on my hands. And that's why I put that or not in there. And that'll make more sense in a few minutes. This is flame screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often say, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Bargain line from my buddy, Greg Morris. Anyway, I talked about this dude in this shirt from Yellowstone, the series, and got me thinking about a trading shirt. There I am in it. Looking pretty lean, huh? <laughs> anyway, I kind of explained that in prior weeks. No need to go through that. One thing that came up this week is I spent a considerable amount of time with one of you guys uh, helping to get up to speed. And um, and I, I realized quite a few things that I, I might not be reaching everyone as much or as efficiently as I should on certain concepts. And there are certain things that that I know that I might not talk about enough. And 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 one of them was like ogres, and also with the Russian dolls. But with the ogres, the opening gap reversal, it's a little bit different in certain ways in the core methodology. And and probably the biggest way is you need super high volume, ideally. And that that doesn't mean. And, and as I was going live tonight, I was thinking about this. It it doesn't mean that you won't trade a thick stock with the core methodology. I think CPE, which ran up 600% before it backed off and stopped us out for a decent gain, you know, 400, 500% there, better than Oakley It had pretty thick volume and it's something I would call a thick stock. In general though, with the core methodology, we're looking for something that's a little bit more inefficient as a general statement. Now, efficient stocks or big cap stocks or high volume stocks whatever you want to call them can make inefficient moves and that's sort of what we're we're looking for with the ogre and then also as i was also explaining to somebody earlier this week on the short side we're kind of looking for those more efficient stocks and waiting for them to make an inefficient move so everybody and their brother loves this certain company some sort of name brand company or whatever and it's been going up forever, and it could be what I call priced for perfection, meaning that it, there's going to be there's going to have to be a plethora of new news coming into this market, new good news, and it's going to have to be fantastic news because everybody's pretty much already long. Okay. Now, getting back to the opening gap reversals, you need a lot of volume because that suggests widespread participation. If you have thin volume on an opening gap reversal the gaps lower and believe me i've learned the hard way it might keep dropping because they might there might be more people that need to get out as opposed to if it has really high volume it's like all these different players begin to jockey for position so for instance and i think i have some paypal charts here in one second although that one failed miserably and we're going to talk about that one if not in the slides we'll get it we'll talk about it when we get to the live charts but although it didn't work, it, it's a good example of a big, thick, well-known stock. And it's been going up for a long, long time. And I'll show you in the charts here in one second. I think I have a chart of it. So if you're a fund manager and you don't have PayPal, your clients are going to see that PayPal chart. 
and think, why not? So if you have a big gap like today, and that also creates tremendous amount of liquidity, uh, it's a liquidity event, so to speak. I don't know if that's the right terminology, but it's a, it's a event that causes a lot of liquidity, right? They could go in and they could buy it at low levels. And then also thinking about like a market maker, he's gonna sell that stock is, or I'm sorry, he's gonna buy that stock from you as cheaply as possible if you're already long. So there's a lot of jockeying for positions and a lot of times they'll go right back up. And when I was looking for some ogre information earlier, I found one of my favorite ogres and that'll make sense when we take a look at that in just one second. Now, as I said a second ago, known or somewhat well-known names as opposed to, it's like I got a, I got a call from Gore's technology and I'm like, who the hell is this? What do you know? And they, they said it about three times. And finally, I realized, well, wait a minute. Oh, that's a Spock company that I'm long. And, you know, <laughs> I'm like, lady, I don't care. I said, it, is there like a board vote? Because they wanted my vote. And I've never had a company call me for a vote. I said, I really don't care. I, it's, I said, I'm a trader. I'm in and out of stuff. Half the time, I don't even know what it is. So Gores, what the hell, what the hell is Gores? I have no idea. But if you're trading an opening gap reversal, you're better off with something that's a little bit more name brand. And that way you've got this heavy institutional participation. Now, I talked about in the past what Linda Rasky calls a burning dog or what somebody in her office calls a burning dog, where they just catch falling knives. And so you get an ogre down to major 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 lows brand new lows all-time lows whatever you don't want to rush out and buy that unless in some rare cases if you're trading etfs or the overall market there might be a chance for a major reversal then but that's a little bit different type of trading and i'll touch upon that when i talk about etfs in just one minute so ideally you want something that's in a serious serious trend and have some sort of setup or knockout type of move that gap down and then you're looking to catch that pop back up one analogy i've heard people use before is like if you've ever done this if you've ever been in a pool grab like a basketball or a volleyball or something and try to push it underwater it's a lot harder than you would think and then when you let it go it pops right back up and that's kind of what happens with these textbook sort of ogres or in an ideal case now, you want strong and ideally persistent and accelerating trend. Now, this is the same sort of thing you would look for in, a core methodo in the core methodology. So we want a nice uptrend that's accelerating, persistent, trades cleanly. All of these things are exactly the same. The difference is you might want a more common name stock or something ideally that has a lot, a lot of volume to it for those aforementioned reasons. And then you want some sort of setup, like a pullback or some sort of TKO. And my favorite ones are when you've got a nice little pullback and then all of a sudden you get a gap way lower and then it comes right back up. Now, you could also have a sharp gap from all time highs. And when I was looking at the ogre screens yesterday and when I began talking with one of you guys about ogres, you were looking at two or three or four of them. And I said, the only one I would trade today, and I didn't trade because I didn't like the spread. And somebody said, what do you mean by spread? Well, spreads are the difference between the bid and the ask. So the bid was like, there was like a point of two difference between the bid and the ask. And in hindsight, I should have just closed my eyes and bought it. And that was a that was a bit of a bummer. And it was kind of interesting. The person that was asking me about it was like, yeah, I took that when I'm up 20 points. I'm like, oh, congratulations. Good job. Now. If you do have a good looking setup, like you look at the Landry list each night and you see something you want to buy and it looks really good. And the Landry list is my pers my own personal watch list that I publish every night for the trading service. And I do keep the, the trading service clients in mind. And 90% and of my setups do come, or 99% do come straight from that Landry list, but I do keep other more volatile maybe, stocks in another momentum list 
where I think it's a little bit too crazy or they don't really fit the methodology just right and, and they're not really worth going after as far as the core methodology. And with the trading service, I'm following that. That's why I call it the core trading service. I'm trying to follow that core methodology as much as possible. And that's kind of the crux of what I do, the bread and butter, longer term at least, not over the short to intermediate term, if I've talked about sometimes, uh, as I've talked about quite often, there will be some drawdowns in trend trading that take a while. But anyway, the Landry list, again, is, is my, my sort of my own personal call list for the most part. And if you go to the frequent, I'll stick a link in post, but if you go to the frequently asked questions of the trading service, I explain it in a lot of detail. So like I said, I, when I was looking for some slides on ogres to see if I had anything already done, which I've done a plethora of stuff. And by the way, if you are a member, a gold member at least, or a service member, which has access to gold, at least for now, you could go to the Q&A. And in the Q&A, we covered opening gap reversals a lot. And, and I think I was telling one of you guys this week that if you would just look at Adam for the first time, and I know I've said this before, you would think this guy just trades opening gap reversals. And it's like, no, I just get more questions on something like opening gap reversals than all of the other stuff combined for the most part this is one of my favorite ones and all those things i just said persistent trend accelerating trend well-known name i know i've heard of cree back in the late 80s early 90s i think i was trading cree on and off here and so it's in a pretty good trend it's starting to pull back as you can see and then it has this big old fat gap lower and then it goes straight back up now I'm kind of beating I kind of beat myself up every time I look at this because I jumped in and got a couple of points and felt like God. <laughs> and then this thing ran like six or seven, eight points afterwards. And I was a bit bummed out that it didn't get that whole move. But I've worked on my money management a little bit more with these ogres to where I could take a piece off a little bit better and have an automated trailing stop, which I wasn't using back then to make my life a lot easier. But anyway, that's what they look like. Generac was one today. Look at this nice, 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 nice persistent uptrend. I've heard of Generac. I've we recently put in a Generac, which is very nice. Little shout out to the company on that. It's nice to over the storm season. We had like a shit ton of uh, <laughs> named storms last year, and half of them hit Louisiana, and that generator came in handy. But anyway, it kind of made a double top in here, and I would kind of consider that knockout move sort of a double top knockout. And it sold off pretty hard, and we'll take a look at an intraday chart on this in just one second on a gap. And what's cool about this one was it kind of continued lower, and then it made the mother of all reversals. Now, again, I didn't like the spread, and, and I was actually kind of pissed off because I'm thinking like if this thing had a little more volume, was a little thicker, I would be all over it. And it turns out it, it did work. And, and to those who took it, congratulations. I might have been looking for a little bit too much perfection, okay? But the volume wasn't tremendous on it. Now here's a 15 minute chart. And like I said, what was kind of cool about this one is it, it gap lower as you can see over here and then just sort of sold off. I actually got excited with PayPal today and bought right around the open like an idiot, okay? And then later took a second trade and that failed miserably too. So I, I kind of screwed up today a little in PayPal, but I'll live to fight another day. Now, the person I was talking to about this particular stock, he bought it off coming off the lows. And I've been guilty of doing that, especially if this drop is really, really, really big and you're seeing some nice weight, wide range bars off the lows. That's okay. But just realize you're getting in a little early. And I guess the good news is your stop is fairly tight because it's down here. But the, the danger you can get in, this is what I was talking about with one of you guys earlier this week, is that you're trading because risks are small and rewards aren't necessarily necessarily large, okay? So you gotta be careful. What I'm saying there is you gotta be careful to try not to bottom fish like down here somewhere, especially thinking that, okay, I'll get in and put a stop right below the low, whatever, and, and there's a nine out of 10 chance you're gonna get knocked out. And then anytime I try to do that kind of trading, I find that I lose a little bit of discipline and before you know it, that one point becomes two, becomes five, and then I'm in a lot of trouble. And then I'm forced out, and of course, that's that's the low, and it comes right back up. 
But anyway, if you do see some wide range bars off the low, you can get a little aggressive. What I often try to do is I try to avoid that little opening range fake out. And I got burnt this morning and I'll stop pitching. <laughs> and then put my order in above the high and let it do what it's going to do. And usually I don't do an aggressive entry. I have been guilty of doing aggressive entries. Every now and then I'll do that. But ideally, you want to wait for it to come back above that high and then look to get in in this particular case. The, the good news about an aggressive entry is by the time you get all the way back up to your more conservative entry, for lack of a better word, you're already hit your initial profit target on the day. OK, so in this case, let's say you got in around, oh, 394 or so. I mean, you're already up. 10 points by the time it, it triggers for a less aggressive entry, okay? But I just want to show you that on the Generac. And if it would have been a little bit thicker, I would have been all over this thing. And, you know, at, at $400 a share, I should have just said, well, one point spread, that's only, uh, that's only like a quarter of a point, I guess, divide that by four. That's only like a quarter point on a, on a hundred dollar stock, and I wouldn't have a problem with that at all, you know. So I think I got a little too caught up in that. But I was hung up on the fact that the volume was only like 700k. If the volume, the average volume, 30 day average or 50 day average volume was 700k, if the volume was much heavier, I would not have worried as much about the spread. I just figured that hey, that's just the way it's trading right now because of the everybody's just jumping all over the place. Anyway. So I kind of beat the dead horse on that one. Here's PayPal today. I would have liked this one better if this leg here was at all-time highs or if this push into new highs was much past all-time highs. You can't always get perfection, though, but this was a good-looking opening gap reversal today. It just didn't really do the opening gap reversal part, and I don't know what time I can. I captured this about midday. We'll look at it when we get to the live charts. Let's see. Okay. I get scared off with the spread, but every time it's worked, and I think spread is demand, which is increasing price, but you have to know how to find a chair. Yeah, I could easily talk out of both sides of my mouth on that. And, and the, the, I keep coming back to the, this guy we were talking about, the, um, the opening gap reversals. And I said, well, Sometimes, and, and I've seen this, I, I know this from my own experience, but I've seen it written many times in Market Wizards, and I've actually heard stories from people. And, and I know, like, Linda Rasky's husband, Damien, filled uh, someone like a huge S&P order for some famous trader. I forget who it was, like 400 contracts, big fat contracts. Which would be like how many e-minis, you know, 4,000 e-minis or something like that, just to, for scale. I forget my math right. But anyway, and he got his price, and he's like, uh oh. He's like, well, what do you mean? I, yeah, I thought I did a good ex got job executing. He's like, yeah, I got him too easy. And I think he flipped him right back out. Whereas if you have a hard time getting your price, it means nobody wants to sell. And, and not to digress too far, imagine that, but it's kind of along the lines of, Dick Arm's ease of movement. Now, I don't use that volume indicator that Mr. Arms has developed and rest in peace. Dick was a great guy. He's no longer with us, but he's a, he was a good guy. <laughs> I guess I'm becoming one of the old guys now in the AAPTA, but American Association of Professional Technical Analysts. But anyway, ease of movement is kind of like if a stock goes up on light volume it means there's demand and nobody wants to sell it that's kind of his theory on volume which is kind of interesting and i think in meta stock they might have something similar or that exact same thing called equal volume or something and i'm not a huge fan of volume other than make sure the stock is thick enough okay and if i were to do do some volume stuff i think that i would kind of embrace something like Dick Arms' work, which kind of goes against conventional wisdom a little bit with like the ease of movement, as opposed to the things you might read in a classical technical analysis book on volume, okay? Okay, now, 
couple things came up about Russian dolls, and and I'm gonna have to start doing more one-on-one -on -one consults with you guys because I think I'm coming across a lot of this stuff, but then I realized that there's some some missing pieces that need to be filled in. So when I say Russian doll, like the little Russian doll you have here, which is a doll inside of a doll inside of a doll inside of a doll inside of another doll. Okay, I'm, that'd be ridiculous. Not not that many. But anyway, they're pretty. I don't know if you ever uh, seen them. You know, I brought I brought some home from Russia, and uh, they they just keep getting smaller and smaller. And there's like a little bitty tiny one way in, up in there. Just when you think you're done, there's like a little tiny one. You know, perfect to choke a small child. <laughs> That's another story. Uh, anyway, so you're looking for a fractal, a pattern within a, a pattern. But I guess I, I didn't flesh it out enough to where it's not always the same pattern. So let's say you've got a nice pullback. Well, you might be looking to trade a bit of a breakout, something that I wouldn't do other than like an IPO, something that I wouldn't do in general. But within an intraday chart, when you've got the big pattern behind you, sort of the, the wind at your back, and you've got the players, pullback players, getting ready to jump on this thing as soon as it takes out the prior high, and you say a little breakout happened, maybe right below the current, the prior day's high, it might be worth a shot. So I took this one recently. And as I often say, I hope, I try and I hope to try to mention everything. I hope that everything I show, I've shown somewhere before, either in Facebook or in the trading service. By Facebook, I mean Dave Landry's Trend Traders, which I think everybody here tonight is a member. And it, the group is free, but to qualify because we're we're, we're trend traders and we're following the general methodology with some ancillary things. You have to be a gold member or a service member. Anyway, I don't know if I mentioned this one directly or not, I'll have to go check, but this one was in my wild and crazy momentum list. Didn't I don't think it made the Landry list because it was so crazy. And it's kind of, from even from my standards and I'm known for trading super volatile stocks, in hindsight, as I was putting my slides together, I'm like, you know, this would have just been a better trend trade, obviously, than going and trying to get a little day trade piece. But anyway, it was a big picture cup and handle. It was a relatively new issue, he tried to say. I would, I would consider it still an IPO. And as I often say, sometimes they come public and just kind of die out. They come public too early or they're priced too high or whatever. They get their act together and then they really take off. And this is kind of the case with this particular one. But I went in on this little pullback in here and I was looking to catch a bit of a rally and an entry for a trend trade might be right around there, an aggressive entry that is. And that's what we're looking to do intraday, but we're not looking to wait for a pullback, although in this particular case, a pullback might've actually worked. We're looking for some sort of breakout intraday. Now, in this particular case, I'm looking at this is a trade I posted to Facebook in answer to a question about automated trailing stops, and I'll explain that in one second. It turned out that it was a true fractal or a true Russian doll, if you want to say that. But in hindsight, looking at this thing, you would have been better off playing a breakout a little bit earlier in the day and caught a little bit bigger move than I did. But I just so happened to see it after it kind of made its big move. And when I saw it taken off again, I figured it was worth a shot. Now, just real quick, not to get too off topic, I know, imagine that. I entered here and I put in a automated trailing stop down here for, let's see, what is that, a half a point. And then I put an IPT for half a point. And this thing triggered, and within a few minutes, I hit the IPT. And then I think after all was said and done, it was like 17 minutes for the entire trade. And I did absolutely nothing other than put it on and try not to watch every tick. So the entry was a stop entry, okay? And that triggered. And then the stop was a trailing stop, which you could do in Thinkorswim and 
possibly some other packages. I know you could do them in Schwab and maybe some other ones, but so those are two big brokerages. Actually, both of them are Schwab now, if you think about it. But anyway, so as this stock rallies, this stop comes up behind it. And I think it's important to have that IPT in there just in case it spikes up and comes right back in. At least you get the IPT. The IPT is a limit order, okay? So the limit order was 848, okay? And I put that in after I triggered. So it's like, okay, I got an 808 round numbers. Add 50 cents to that. What's that? 848, okay? Or maybe it's 40 cents. <laughs> anyway, oh, is that the later one? Anyway, 40 or 50 cents on this. And then it stopped out on a remainder at 827 because as this is moving higher and higher, this trailing stop is following it. And then that was it for the day. So that one little pop that I caught and that was it. And I have a bad habit sometimes, not all the times. And this is especially true if I try to reverse a position. That, that's a real Steve Ladd. Steve Ladd was this dude that went through the tunnel of fire and spoiler alert, it ended badly. It actually ended pretty good. He made it through the tunnel of fire. They light a bunch of hay bales on fire to where it's a complete, just a big old burning tunnel of fire, I guess, for lack of a better word. That's what I call it, tunnel of fire. <laughs> Little tiny elbows coming out there. And uh, he made it through and he's like, all right, I'm 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 Iron Man, right? I'm a tough guy. So he completed the feat, but then he turns around, tries to go back through, and he didn't come out the other side, unfortunately. So here's another Russian doll set up, and this is this was in the Landry list, but this was too volatile once again, too wild and crazy. I mean, look at the retrace on that. It's huge. It's like a 50%, not that I would trade a 50% retrace, but it just looked like it had tremendous momentum, but then it also had a super deep retrace. Too crazy to put it on a trend trade, but I figured it was worthwhile as an intraday trade. So my intraday entry on this one was right there as it began to rally. And let's see where that is, 580 something, whatever. I don't think I have the actual trade in here. Yeah, so I was looking to like a little breakout above the prior high. And I was like, okay, I'm going to put my order way up here. And if it gets hit, bam, it got hit on the first bar. It came back in a little bit and then it took off. And I was able to use that little technique I just showed you with the limit and the trailing stop. Now, I don't know if I closed the loop on, on the Steve Ladd, but the reason I was thinking about that on a prior chart, and this one too probably, is that I took the LHDX off my watch list after I made money for the day because I know I'd be tempted to go back in and where I get very angry at myself is if I'm trading an ETF and then I try to play both sides and I do really well on one side and then I lose all that money trying to play the other side and you got to be careful not to revenge trade it was tempting to short PayPal today Maybe I did a little. <laughs> Where's my shame bell? Oh, here it is. <laughs> I rang that mofo all day. All right. So we talked a lot about doing trading stuff. But one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is not doing trading stuff when there's no trading stuff to do. And I, I think that's one of the secrets to trading. I don't have the book around me, but you know, I always tell a story about back in the trading markets days, I wouldn't lose clients or many clients if I had a bad streak and was continuing to recommend stocks during that bad streak. The only time I'd really lose clients was when I'd stop recommending stocks because the conditions weren't conducive. And then the salesman will call me up and beg. I know I've said that ad nauseum. But I recently read in a book called The Investor's Brain, and I would recommend you read, and I'll put the quote in post, but essentially through a bunch of little tests, they figured out that people who owned stocks, and it's it probably 
relates to the what's called the endowment effect in the behavioral finance, behavioral science, behavioral science world. But the people who own stocks, even if the outcome wasn't so great, if they were losing money on the, on the stock, they actually felt better than people who didn't own stock, okay? In their, in their particular experiment. There's a lot more details to it than I'm giving you, but it was kind of good to see that reinforced through some sort of scientific experiment. I was like, oh yeah, well, I've, I've experienced that 20 something years ago. So especially the more novice type, I know you guys that are here tonight and girls, you know that a lot of times you just have to sit on your hands and wait and wait and wait. And believe me, the, the secret to trading is to obviously make sure that you're making money on the good days, but also try not to get chewed up too much on the bad days. Now, with the ETF stuff last week, I went in and said, I was doing a little forensics, and I said, okay, on these HG days, which I'll explain in a little more detail, but those are like nice wide range bars where you want to get in and you want to make some money. I went in and circled them. And I missed one because I was traveling and I was actually, there's no way to make the trade on that one. But I went in and all, looked at all the days where I should have really made money and I did fairly well. Now, what I didn't show you, and that's why last week I said, hey, am I awesome or what? What I didn't show you was on some of those narrow range bars in here, I got chewed up. And I'm working to avoid getting chewed up so as you have to first make sure you recognize when it's a good day to trade and if you're trading a trend methodology like mine the core methodology recognize when conditions are conducive and let the database talk to you like i often say if you're seeing a plethora of shorts setting up and you can't find a long to save your life maybe you should fire off a short or two or at least just sit on your hands and that's what we've been doing quite a bit lately but just as important as it is to make money when the sun shines you have to know when to not trade and believe me that's that's a that is the holy grail if you could figure that out and that's something i'm working hard on especially with these intraday etfs so at it's more important or as important to make sure that you're not staying that you are staying out on the bad days to the best of your abilities. You're going to have some losses. I added that I added that to the best of your abilities at the last moment because you're going to have some losses. Now, last week I talked about, I think it was last Thursday, about a week ago today, if that's correct. Yeah, 22nd, today's 29th. I talked about how four or five of these leverage ETFs they all were contained within the prior day's range and I didn't take any trades. I also had someone sort of looking over my shoulder, so to speak, and I didn't want to look like an idiot and take bad trades. So I saw maybe I looked a little bit harder at the fact that these were inside days developing. Now you don't know it when you're looking at them. Well, you look at, if you look at a daily chart, and it's contained within the prior day's range and then you know it's an inside day so far now i talked a lot about the this type of thing last week so go in and watch that show but i had about four examples i think lab u Soxel, um fang not fang d but um j nug and gush all were inside days last thursday and I didn't take the trades. So today I started doing a lot more analysis and it was a very, very slow process at first, but now I kind of got the hang of it to figure out how to do this and download spreadsheets of trades, at least in one account that I'm really active in. I am, I do trade these ETFs in more than one account. And by the way, I haven't fully figured them all out. And, and in markets, it's interesting, and not the last week of Bandcamp, but and talking with one of you guys, I was explaining, it's like, look, you're fairly new to this and you're you're coming up to speed at a tremendous rate. Just know that you'll never you'll never know everything. You'll never have that holy grail or anything. And you're always, you know, you occasionally will do some dumb stuff, and then you're always going to be learning. And the example I've given a thousand times was 
many, many years ago, I started working with a, a trader who was a little older and very well seasoned trader, been around for a while. And what amazed me is after working with him for six weeks, the trader that he was six weeks ago is not the same trader that he was six weeks later. It's like, I actually, that was an amazing thing for me. And this guy had been probably been trading for 20 years. And within a six week time period, I saw him get better. And, and that just kind of was like one of those mind blowing experiences. But anyway, getting back to this ETF stuff, I went back a week and I grabbed Soxel. And that day there was probably not the best day to trade, but it did trade outside of the prior range. This day here was a really good day. It's almost what I call a holy grail day, and I'll explain that in one second. So on a wide range bar day like that, even though it's not labeled any wide range bar, just eyeballing it, it looks like it's a pretty wide range. It's like, if I see this bar on a chart and I'm trading an intraday ETF, I'm thinking, you know what? I sh probably should have made money on that day. So I checked and I didn't make a fortune, but I made a little bit on that day. And you know what's interesting is I'm actually starting to become more proud on the days that I didn't trade it. And maybe like the guy I was just talking about, maybe this is the six weeks time period, right? Where I'm getting a little better than I was earlier this summer or late spring. But I actually am starting to get excited about like last Thursday, this was an inside day and I didn't take a trade. And then Last Friday, it was an inside day and I didn't take a trade and I felt pretty good about that. Now, this one broke above the prior day's range. I think I anticipated a little bit and that's only 60 bucks. So it looks like it's 160, but that's the way the pin worked. But it's, it's so, I lost 60 bucks. You know, I'm not happy about that, but I didn't get creamed. Now, here's an HG7 day. Now, this isn't an ideal HG7 day, although it can offer opportunities on both sides you just got to be careful not to steve lad it and i think i steve ladded it a little bit but i'll explain that in one second now on a bar chart a, a wide range i'm sorry an hg7 day is two things it's the widest range bar out of seven days and it doesn't get far above the open it starts at one side it doesn't have to end at the other side as long as it goes far enough to where I feel like if it's a wide range bar seven and it never goes much above the open, like you can see very tight here. I think the candle people call that a shaved open, okay? So on a candle chart, it would look like that. That would be an ideal day, but in this particular case, it sold off hard. You should be able to get a little money out in that nice little downtrend and then you got to be careful but sometimes you can get a little bit of money on the way back up now in this particular case i made 66 on the long side in soxl and i made a 192 dollars on the short side so i caught that trend wrote it down all day took some partial profits and then popped back up and this by the way is in one of my more active accounts which i like to pull the trades out of Now this is the biotech, I think for the last week, same sort of analysis in here. And that other chart I showed you that didn't have the any losses in it, I wanted to show you that there are losses that happen. And I work on to try not to, to try to avoid these super narrow range bar days and stay out of trouble and inside days and things like that. But just going back and looking at this, biotech chart you could see on this inside day there were no trades and then i made a little lost a little made a little and overall i did okay for the week and i caught that hg7 that i think was yesterday now getting back to this chart here and i don't know if you'll be able to see this or not but this was the work i've been doing to produce these charts and this is what like i said it was i wasn't very efficient at it until i just printed off the chart and you know it's, it's kind of like I need a fourth monitor to put this up. It's like, well, Dave, you know you got a printer, <laughs> just use a printer. And anyway, I said, well, all these black candles back here. Let me just see how I did on those days. And on this narrow range seven day, I lost sixty five dollars. Now, 
my big question is why was I trading on this day? I guess I need to see the prior bar or two and figure out what it was. But then on subsequent days, like on this HG7 day here, I did 207, and then on this day here, 658, okay? And this day here, I actually did not do any trades for whatever reason, and maybe I just didn't feel like it was developing enough, and I need to, and I'm working on this. It's still a work of progress, obviously. And then on the next day here, I ended up trading on both sides, 298 and 140, and a loss of 145 for a net of 153. Oh, there it is right there. Okay, so I have that one in there. Yeah, that's the main thing I want to look at was these big fat candles to make sure that I did okay on those days. So where I, what I'm getting at with all this is work hard to make sure you're making money on the days you should be trading. And on the days that you shouldn't be trading, try to stay out of the market. Now, a lot of this is going to be in hindsight, and I'll have to get this graph in next week. But this is, so this is biotech, and this is biotech to win a little bit different dates in here. But I'll, I'll, I'll get it in, but you can see that there was a an HG, HG7 day there, and I was able to, to do okay on that particular day. And then the other thing I did in here, and this is something that might help longer term, and I might need to start saving this, is this little zigzag here, that's what that market did on that particular day, okay? So for instance, like on this one right here, it made kind of a V-shaped. So I'm gonna put like a V on here so I know what happened intraday, because eventually what'll happen is you'll lose that intraday data. And plus you can know at a glance how the market traded. So lots of lots of stuff here, a little bit outside of what I normally do, and you know here I am spending all this time on something I, I, that that's not my core methodology, but it's I'm here anyway, and if I could take advantage of these situations and put on some trades while I'm doing some other stuff and waiting for the core stuff to work or waiting for core setups or looking for core setups, then by all means, and that's as you likely know, I call these the profit center so. Anyway, kind of all over the place with that, but you kind of get the idea. You want to try to stay out of the market as much as possible. I went back in and grabbed the service going back to, I guess this was on 713 or 714, probably 714. And I noticed I had none there, and I don't think I had any setup that I showed in the service since 714. So where are we now? So that's been two weeks and change with no setups. And I'm, and of course, I know some people are gonna leave because they're looking for action and that's fine, you know? But you gotta look at these things longer term and then you gotta hang in there because sooner or later you will catch that 600% move. But in the meantime, you don't wanna put capital in the harm's way. And, and believe me, if I could figure out how to not ever put capital in the harm's way, you'd never see my fat ass again. And obviously, that's a grail hunt. It's like first time I developed the mechanical system, as I said a thousand times. I'm like, okay, well, I just got to eliminate all the losers. <laughs> and then this thing's just going to work great. And then realize, I didn't realize I was looking for a grail hunt. Yeah, George says database is talking. Now, over that period of time, I thought it'd be interesting to show you the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 began to implode, sort of, okay? And that lead led me to believe that, okay, this market's in a whole a lot of trouble. Maybe we need to start shorten. But as a trend follower, you're going to need a little bit more confirmation. And then it went straight back up. And what's interesting is on a net-net basis, at least to yesterday's close, this was, I did this intraday, so I didn't know where we'd end up today. The market's only up 0.37% over two weeks and change. So that's not a good market to be a trend trader. And obviously we did get knocked out of some positions on that slide. Now, one thing I was thinking about while going live, and when we get to the live charts, I'll show you, you have to see each position to its fruition. So when the market starts getting a little iffy, you don't want to necessarily bail out. And I'll show you an example where even if you had a crystal ball, 
at least in one particular case, it was worth sticking sticking it out. There's always a reason to exit a stock and never a reason to trade. And never a reason to stay. Sorry about that. There's always a reason to exit a stock and never a reason to stay, or rarely a reason to stay. You could always make an excuse to get out of a stock. Well, the market's weakening, the sector's weakening, or whatever's going on, okay? Inflation is here, right? Well, just honor your stops, and if you get taken out, you get taken out. So again, figure out when to trade. That's a big piece, and I know that takes a while to learn that, but a lot of that, I don't want to say mechanical, but it's fairly mechanical, okay? Just like I said earlier, hey, you want to trade these open-gap reversals, make sure it's got a plethora of volume. <laughs> got to stop saying shit done so much. <laughs> you kids got me saying that. You know, I don't want to be an old fart too soon. <laughs> I saw a shirt that I'm going to have to get. Uh, I guess I need to wait a few years. Maybe once I get a grandkid, I might have to get it. It says, uh, don't piss off old people. Life in prison doesn't scare them <laughs> as much as it used to or something like that. Anyway, I digress. But the secret, and you got to be careful because it is a bit of a grail hunt, is like figure out when not to trade. And I know I'm always focusing on what the best setups look like. And I, and I know that you should really focus on that. Like the counterfeit currency detective doesn't go out and look at crappy bills. He goes out and looks at the genuine article. And then when he sees a fake, it's pretty obvious. I got 10 grand of money here laying around. So... You know, a counterfeit currency detective would probably look at this and say, well, hang on a second. <laughs> I don't know if that's real or not. <laughs> anyway, so you want to study the, the good charts, but you also need to know a lot about the bad charts or when conditions aren't conducive. George is saying the database is talking. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of shorts that are setting up, but not enough to really, really get worried about. If you watch tonight's service, you'll see. And if you're not on the service, I'll get the archives available soon. So you can go to davelander.com slash archives and check them out. If you don't mind, subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Dave Landry, and I will give you a high five. I, don't, I guess we can't give high fives anymore because of Corona. Huh? <laughs> As I mentioned a second ago, review the archives to trading service. If you're on a trading service, there's a link below the recent services. If you're not, this page is not firewalled, if that's the correct terminology. Daylander.com slash archives. You get to see things warts and all. And also, if you're not a gold member, why not? <laughs> it's 47 bucks a month. It, it's really struck a chord with a lot of people and we're having a blast in the Facebook group and I'm getting a lot of good trades from you guys. So I appreciate that. All right, let's hop over to the live charts. A couple of things I want to show you real quick. And uh, you guys want to ask about some individual stocks, feel free to do so now. So let me get over to TC. So what I wanted to show you real quick before I hopped into the overall market was, let's say you had a crystal ball and you knew for a fact that metals and mining was going to top out on 511 okay so that's the all-time high for metals and mining 511 and you were long a metal arlp which we are in the service on 511 so arlp was at six dollars and 17 cents let's go back to the metals real quick and what happened to the metals? Because you had a crystal ball, you knew that was a top. The metals dropped on the first leg lower. They dropped 13.65%, okay? That's significant, okay? Especially for a sector. So let's say you had a crystal ball and you knew that was going to implode. Well, from the 11th, on okay let's go to, to today's date or even if you go to some of the dates during the slide it was up from that date to that date miraculously i don't know how but then now take a look at it it's up 34 percent round numbers 
since the top, which you had a crystal ball for, a new in the metals. Now, I'm going to use the word hope. I'm hoping a, this happens with a couple of more stocks in the portfolio so I can have a good example for seeing each position to its fruition, right? Just let that stop take you out of your positions and don't throw caution to the wind. Obviously, if you're not stopped out, then stick with it, right? But I just want to show you an example. Even if you had a crystal ball, it'll tell you that metals were done. This one went on to make new highs, and that's why we, we tough it out, even though something like CPE could be quite painful, and we talked about that last week. If you look at what you made net-net, you made a boatload of money, but if you look at what you made from the peak down, what you gave up, so to speak, it's not as impressive. All right, let's take a look at the P's real quick, and then let's take a look at a couple of, uh, take a look at NASDAQ and the rest of SP 500 just shy of all time highs. I can't see my screen. I think the screensaver's done, but uh, I know that I got stopped out of a futures position right after the close. So I know the futures were dropping, as were the F bombs. <laughs> I had a bad day. I actually emailed my wife and said, just so you know, I had a bad day. I had a bad day a couple of days ago. And she's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, Arr. you know, it's like, so give her a heads up. I'm going to come in growling tonight. Anyway, uh, SP 500 was up a smidge today. It's, I know it's given up some of that after hours. I don't want to chase my own tail and watch it too much, but let's see how we open tomorrow. As a general statement, I think I said this in the service tonight, that as long as the market is at or near new highs, give it the benefit of the doubt. And even in these recent spills in here, I showed the TFM 10% system and showed that you had a long, long, long ways to go to get a trigger. It's not that you shouldn't get cautious here and here, okay? Do all of your stops, but don't rush out and get shaken out of everything before you get stopped out. Now, one thing I can guarantee you, so don't come bitching to me, <laughs> but one thing I can guarantee you, let's say you got 10 longs on and the market starts correcting and it keeps correcting, keeps correcting, keeps falling, keeps falling. There'll be a time in your career where you get knocked out of nearly everything or everything, and you're going to wish you would have, in hindsight, obviously, exited. Longer term, though, one or two out of the portfolio can, can be a keyword in that sentence, take off. And all it takes is one or two to make all the difference in the world. Who knows? I mean, the CP, I know I'm beating a dead horse on that, but hopefully I'll have a new one to talk about was down in, in the single digits and it ran to 60 something a share, right? Or in the 60s, I know we gave up some in the end, but still round number seven to 45 or whatever it was is, is better than a Pokemon eye, right? Well, the ARLP, and again, we don't know yet what's gonna happen, but we're in a good place with ARLP. We're in trend following, longer term trend following mode. Who knows? We got in at four and change or whatever it was. and I think we're closing in on double or close at least. Don't quote me on that. You can look at the archives and see where we got in and where it is now. But maybe, just maybe, it'll be at 30 or 40 or 50 a year from now. And I hate to say hope, but let's hope. So Craig says Amazon is falling. I don't have live charts that we, we can look at. It. What's, what are you seeing it? 303333, okay? So it's down here somewhere. Now, Amazon, I probably wouldn't play the Ogre tomorrow just because it's kind of wide and loose in here and not like a perfect setup. You take a look at like GNRC, that was a little closer to a more perfect setup, okay? So Amazon, I'm not going to get too excited about the Ogre there, okay? Although it might make a pretty big reversal. You know, maybe, I probably won't do it, but maybe take a look at the options on Amazon just for S and Gs, but be careful with that. That's not a really clean setup ogre. The NASDAQ was up a smidge today, just off all time highs. I don't know how it's gonna be affected by the ogre, by the uh, Amazon. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty still looks like a big fat top. However, it's not that far away from all time highs, 4%, and this thing can move two, 3% in a day, right? 
and it's back above the 30 EMA, it's above the 20 EMA, and of course the 10 EMA, EMA two. I'm sorry, the 10 is simple in this case, this is a bow tie moving average. They're still in downtrend proper order, but if it stays above these moving averages, it'll cross back over to the upside. So for now, I was gonna say put a gun to my head, my wife does like when I say that, but um, you know. <laughs> Pitch my nipple, <laughs> pitch my nipples or torture me. I don't know. That might be enjoyable. I don't know. Uh, and he asked me for an answer. Maybe I have to edit that out. Uh, I'd say it's still a top for now, but as long as above the moving averages, let's just see how it shakes out. Energies look like they still are a top to me. A little support back here in the energies, okay? Which they could find a little support, but I, as a general statement, I think it might be worth shorting energies overall, but on an individual basis, they're not as exciting to me because a lot of them have a lot of support below. Now, one thing that I wouldn't mind doing, at least on an intraday basis, and keep in mind that these things, as I said in, in the long, lengthy Facebook posts, eventually go to zero, but shorter term, something like the drip, especially if we get a big gap lower, if we get, get a little excitement in oils and then it reverses, might be worth an intraday trade. And just as you look at, uh, you know, pick your favorite ETF for oil. This is the exploration of production. And you can see little little support, not a whole lot, but bow tie down, pulling back. So it looks like energies are in trouble. Now take a look at metals and mining. I think Mike P a few weeks ago said, Dave, what if all these weaker areas start to improve? It's like, well, that would certainly help the market out. And you had the metals, which looked like they were rolling over and they bow tied down, all of a sudden are starting to go straight back up. So that's kind of exciting. And if you get a few more, more of those weaker areas doing that, then the overall market will obviously improve. Banks still look like they're in trouble, but you know what? They're improving, right? Just pulling back so far. But if they get above the bow tie moving averages, maybe just sit it out a little bit, see what happens. MNC, look at that. I just thought this was the mother of all tops. Shorted some home builders. That's not working so good, right? And look at that. To my amazement, I'm just seeing it tonight because I just put the bow ties on. Bow ties are backing up trend proper water. Nothing magical about that, but it, hand keep, it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. So some of the weak areas are coming back. The retail stocks are just off all-time highs. They're looking pretty good. On the flip side, especially retail had lost a little steam, looking a little better in here, but you can see a little choppy and sideways compared to retail overall. Transports still look a little dubious in here, as you can see, downtrend proper order, downtrend just by eyeballing it, okay? A little minor double top up here. But on the upside, you got software just off of all-time highs, okay? So the point I'm trying to make is it's a little mixed out there, but it's improving once again. But as I often preach, one day at a time, okay? With the futures weakening, at least they were earlier, I'm not looking at a live screen now, and Amazon getting whacked or whatever. And if Amazon does an opening gap reversal tomorrow, then maybe we'll have a little weakness and we'll have to deal with tomorrow. But that would just be more evidence of why we're sitting on our hands. That would just be more choppy trading action. All right, I think I've covered everything I want to cover. There's a lot of things that I covered tonight I want to flesh out as I figure a lot of things out and as I do a lot of, of this type of forensics. And this isn't always fun, although I kind of had fun doing it today because I'm a nerd. But I think if if you keep working to get better, and, and this is called deliberate practice, it's like, okay, let's look at what I did and boy, I was stupid. Why did I do that? And then how can I prevent that again? And just realize that you will have losing days. But one thing that's kind of exciting for me is a lot of my losing days aren't that big compared to compared to the occasional big winning days. And that's got me feeling pretty good about this type of, of research. And I'll continue to share this with you as I go. And I think, as I said, last few weeks, I don't always, I don't work on this for three years and then present it to you, something something that's a little outside of the core methodology, I just show it to you as I'm working on it. And I'm getting better at it, I think. So stay tuned there. All right, any individual stocks you guys wanna look at? I know we kind of talk about things all day on Facebook. CTKB, CTKB. 
yeah, this is this is going to be a an IPO, obviously. And let's check the volume on it. That's where it gets a little tricky. Um, one thing that I'm I'm immediately kind of jumping out at me is that it could use a little bit more range. Okay. Now remember with the buy at B, was it was it a new closing high today? Yes. Was it five days? Yes. Should you have bought it? Well, no, because it didn't close above the day one high, and that day one high set the high for the week, remember? So you got to close it with this high. So this is close to a signal. And again, the range is a little small, but I have to say, and the volume looks pretty good. So tomorrow, and, and if you go through the IPO course, there's the buy at B plus one, which is you're getting in on a day six close versus a day five close. And that could also work out nicely too. But if tomorrow, if this thing rallies nicely above this prior high, I might be willing to go long on the close. If it looks like it's going to rally and sustain that rally intraday, I might take a look at it. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. There's a few days in here where the volume is a little on the light side, but let's just see what happens. You had a million shares today, so that should be plenty. So, oh, John, yeah, John Ross, yeah. <laughs> John's our uh, resident IPO guru. So, yeah, appreciate you bringing that up. It's it's kind of cool how we're each getting our different specialties in the group. Loma Negra, Campania, Industrial, Argentina, Sociedad. Loma. Yeah, this is in uh, an uptrend for sure. Yeah, Loma on a pullback, why not? A uh, little bit on the thin side, though, okay? Also, foreign cement. But, yeah, uh, that looks pretty good. Oh, longer term. Let's make sure we're not unadjusted. Yeah, longer term, you got some issues. I think I would pass. And you're like, oh, Dave, that's a long time ago. It's like, well. <laughs> Dave, do you clients really talk like that? Yeah, some of them do. Uh, this would bother me a little bit way back here. Just just because sometimes markets have long memories. Now I know it's uh with a Spanish accent. <laughs> I know I did weird. You start <laughs> uh hey, I'm gonna get in trouble if I tell a story, but let's just say I was talking with someone today and I started talking in their accent back to <laughs> like that would make them understand me more. Uh, yeah, I would I would pass based on that. I hear you though, Craig. That looks great. Nice persistent trend over here, but this longer term wide and loose action, a little too wide and loose. Any any other ones? Yeah, sorry about you know last week I said we worked to get everybody in the in the uh, show, but. Uh, I ran into a glitch with GoToWebinar. CNM. All right, let's take a look. Yeah, yeah, that's um. Let's see what this is. Core in Maine. Anybody know what to do? Range is a little small, but not too too bad. I guess it's it's okay. One, two, three, four, five. Bam! You would have been long today, right? Um, one, two, three, four. Five, yeah, buy at B would have been long today. So you can look at buy at B plus one, okay? Oh, good job, good job, John. You guys are long, okay, cool. Yeah, I like it, I do, I do. Um, the range could be a little bit better. Sometimes I think I look for, occasionally look for too much uh, too much perfection, but uh, good job on those guys. I was just, I just had a, crappy day and uh, were you guys talking about this in facebook if you were thank you for doing that for everybody else that was john doing it thank you john appreciate it you're uh i'm gonna have to give you a little hat that says uh ipo group guru but yeah uh and again sometimes you get that buy a b plus one pattern so if it doesn't get away from you too much tomorrow, but then that would kind of increase the range and make it better. So somewhere, if it doesn't go too crazy, it might be worth a shot. And sometimes they 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 make that new closing high, come back in a little bit, 
and then they take off again, which is kind of cool too. So kind of watch out for that pattern. And that's something that I've been kind of looking at from an empirical standpoint. In other words, just looking at charts. Let me just see if I can think of an IPO that I'm long that might have done that. Of course, Tremira got, uh, or whatever it is. This one got whacked a little today. Uh, let me think what else. MK, MFKW, is that it? Anyway, there's an IPO somewhere. Um, I just want to try to see if I can find an example real quick, real quick on the fly. I gotta watch my watch list name. Sometimes I put stuff in here. I put a lot of F COVIDs when I had COVID. <laughs> Let's see if I can find the IPO that I was talking about. A good IPO example. The buy it B. Yeah, sometimes this might not be a perfect example, but I'm long this one. One, two, three, four, five. Technically, your buy would have been here, but then it came back in. Sometimes those re-triggers on buy at Bs could be a great thing. Oh, look, you're saying, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're one step ahead of me, Jeff. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm long this one, okay? And let's see, one, two, three, four, five, it barely triggered. And, and as I said, I think last week's, in last week's presentation, it, sometimes I won't take them on just a little tiny trigger like that. I'll wait for something more convincing. And then the next couple of days, I was <laughs> questioning my sanity. But sometimes these re-triggers on the buy at Bs, especially if they barely trigger, can be worthwhile. So the point I'm trying to make is the one we were just looking at, day six would be tomorrow, and it might be worthwhile. Craig is long E R A S. We're we're all starting to think alike too much. That's uh that's a little scary, but exciting, right? Okay, Jeff said he waited for the second trigger did that impress me on the first. Yeah, I agree with you. And 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 there's been and and you know, this is where I'm always you're always doing this psychological introspection. Because as I was buying this one, I'm like, how many times have I told people, yes, technically this would be an entry? but I prefer a more convincing entry, okay? A more solid trigger, right? Well above this prior high, I'm sorry, closed. And then I went ahead and took it. You know, did I take it? You know, then I start thinking, well, am I in a drawdown, trying to come out of the drawdown or, or is it gut feel or why do I like it so much? You know, so it's funny, you, you come up with all these things and you're trying to be as true to your system or as true to your methodology as possible. But then sometimes you're kind of like, oh, let's just let's just take it, you know. So I try to factor all that into my decision process, and maybe I was just a little anxious to to get an IPO on the books to work. And knock on wood, looks like it did okay today. But yeah, uh, as a general, if you're new to IPOs, I would say wait for a lot more solid entry than that. Something that looks more like today, right? Okay, something that stands out like a sore thumb, as opposed to the squint your eyes and then. You know, you're right around the close, not sure if it's going to trigger or not. And I think I was kind of front running it, thinking that it would continue higher. Okay, John says, I think the buy of these is starting to work again. Yeah, somebody emailed me who does a lot of research. In fact, he was he was hired by someone I know years ago to do consulting to do research. And, and uh, he's really good at this kind of stuff. And a real cerebral and engineering type that just kind of picks this stuff apart. But sometimes I think you just kind of have to go with feel a little bit and you have to also say, well, they're not really working now, but let me continue to chip away at it because let's say this ER, he said he's taking a break for now, okay, because they haven't been working lately. Well, let's say this ERAS takes off, then maybe, just maybe, this, this might pay for the other losers that I have, okay? <laughs> I have a hat that says a hole and he says it's spelled out number 147 <laughs> that's another story well good you'll have to tell us that story sounds good we're going to get together and do a retreat and uh and we go to the bar and tell us some stories right anybody else any other ones uh you guys want to look at tonight Gone once, gone twice. 
Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule. Sorry about the glitches with the show. I'm going to continue to work on that. Eventually, I'm going to put people on these things so I don't have to bother with these things. And I'll know before 10 minutes, uh, I'll know a day before the show goes live whether or not we've got an issue or not and can work to have it fixed. But uh, it's that's a work in progress, too, but we're working on it. I'm too busy trading and having fun with you guys and Facebook and some of this business stuff is not getting taken care of. And I, and I realize that I'm working on it. <laughs> but you, you said last year you're working on it. Yeah, no, I'm still working on it. All right, everybody have a great night. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody enjoy your weekend. Thank you so much. I'll see, I think most everybody here in Facebook tonight. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. And I'll see most of you guys again and girls in Facebook tomorrow. Thank you so much.